weeks from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we return, and we are right at the beginning of chapter 5, where we briefly looked at these uh, first words here in connection with the latter part of chapter 4. And I want to revisit one word in verse 24, and then notice the connection in the very next word. Is the word multitudes. As we look at chapter 4, verse 25, it says, And the great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from the capitals, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Now, verse 1 says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. When he was seated, his disciples came to Immediately it says here in our English version, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, now, ordinarily we would say that the word taught them, pronoun there would be to its closest antecedent, and that would in fact be the disciples. Uh, in this case, I think that is correct, rather than him addressing the multitudes. Uh, some would disagree with me, they would say, even though the closest antecedent is the disciples, it really is a, a sort of manifesto for everybody. Uh, one of the reasons why I think that my reading of it is correct is if you look in chapter 6 and verse 20, giving us the Luke conversion of the sermon, it tells us very plainly that he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples. And say, and he begins with the Beatitudes there. Now, what is interesting is that if you look back in chapter 6 of Luke, and it tells us, and he came down with them and stood on a little place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people. So, there again, you have this multitude. But Luke makes it very clear in his version that Jesus speaking the words in the Sermon on the Mount are not directed to everyone, but they are directed to his disciples. And I think this is very significant because what he is giving us here, he is in fact the kingdom ethic for Christians. He is not addressing non-believers, he is not instructing them uh, in sort of general human kindness, but this is a kingdom ethic. This is for believers. And the purpose of it is found at the end look at the end of this discourse, the Olivet Discourse, um, I'm sorry, the Sermon on the Mount, as it's referred to, uh, he says at the end here that, therefore those of you who hear these sayings of mine and do them, I shall liken you to a person who builds his house on a rock and then the wind and the waves come. And he also says that those of you who hear these words and do not do them, so this becomes a really sort of tension-filled manifesto because he's addressing those who are his followers, his disciples, and he warns them, suggesting that something may come in their lives and they walk away. Well, does that happen in the New Testament? Yes, it does. If you read in John's Gospel, you will find that many follow him. They came behind him as his disciples, and then as his disciples, they turned and followed him no longer. Now, there are some among us within Christendom that suggest that this is clear proof that one can lose your salvation. One can, you know, follow Christ, be born again, and then be that, 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 that. I do not share that opinion. I don't think that's the purpose of this text. What I do believe about it, however, is that we need to do what God tells us to do. There's just no way around that. We have to fulfill this kingdom ethic, and it is not an easy one. In fact, it begins challenging everything that we hold dear and what we consider to be blessings in the Christian life. If you go around and ask a group of 100 Christians what they are blessed with, probably a good portion of them, the majority, I would say, will speak to you course of Jesus and his salvation in some vague and general way, but then they will begin to express 
how they have been blessed with material prosperity, how God has provided for their needs, how they had plenty to leave for their children, etc., etc., etc. Now, when we look at what true blessedness is from both Matthew and Luke, we'll find that traditional or common popular understanding turn on its head completely. And so we will be challenged to revisit what it is that we think blessedness actually is. According to Jesus, here he opens his mouth and says the following, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let us pray. Dear God, we come hungry and thirsty for truth. We long to be blessed as you define blessedness. We long to find ourselves characterized by these beatitudes that reflect us as authentic disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. All we can do is cry out for mercy and say, instill in us these traits that we can reflect the glory of our God in this whole world. And Lord, we know that you are the sovereign king who rules this world and that nothing comes in our path apart from your glory. Let us be submissive, let us be obedient for the sake of Christ who loved us and gave himself on the cross for us. Combine these 
words of Jesus, you will see that we have got it absolutely wrong. We have flipped this on its head. We say, blessed are you when you are rich. We say, blessed are you who are full. We say, blessed are you when you laugh. We say, blessed are you when men speak of you. It is the complete opposite of the truth. How can we get to a point where the prophets prophesy falsely and my people love to have it so? How can we get to a point where we turn everything on its head, where we call good bad and bad good? get to a place, even as a nation, where we kill the unborn and we rejoice in it? How can we get to this point? We turn everything on its head. Jesus has given us the truth here that is not very popular. And it certainly isn't an easy path. Following Him means a life of challenge and difficulty. Following Christ means that we have to put the kingdom purposes first beyond our own comforts. He says we should rejoice even when we're persecuted. Look at what He says. He says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, there's a misunderstanding here, I think, that this rejoicing is supposed to be something that we will have later on when we get that reward. Luke doesn't read that way. Look at what he says. Listen to these words again. He says, blessed are you when men hate you or when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Listen to this. Rejoice in that day and live for joy. For indeed, your reward is great in heaven. What day are we to rejoice in? The day we are persecuted, the day we are reviled for Christ, the day we are undergoing the difficulties for the sake of the kingdom, the day we are thirsting and hungry for righteousness and for the kingdom to be expanded, when people accuse us, when they turn us out, when they speak evil of us, in that day rejoice. Because it is blessed to suffer for glory's sake. It is blessed to suffer. Christ said. This is what Peter says in his letter. Exactly the same thing. We want the opposite. We don't like this. These are harsh words. These are difficult truths. These are challenging sayings. These are not your God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life sermons that you hear all over the place. This is the call to discipleship. And discipleship means taking up your cross. Dying to self. It means being persecuted for Christ's sake. This is not a cross because you've got sin. Oh, I've been diagnosed with this terminal disease. That's my cross, I guess. Everybody gets sick and dies. This is not the cross. The cross is not that you have a handicapped child that you have to raise. Your cross is not the difficult mother-in-law that you just can't get on with. Your cross is being persecuted for kingdom's sake. How many of us are living lives for the kingdom's sake that demands, that cries out and says, persecute me for Jesus? That's what we need to be thinking about. Not this nonsense about his prosperity and affluence. And here's ease. The 
Bible is full of woe to those who are at ease in Zion. We don't want ease, we want truth. We don't want just happiness now. We just don't want to be comforted in the, in the, in the meantime and then lose our souls. We want God to be pleased with us. We want God to smile on us. Even if the whole world is against us. We want to be authentic disciples. We want to be those who live this kingdom ethic. We want to be characterized as poor in spirit. We don't want to be the elite of the world. We don't want to rule the world. We're content with places of humility. We are those who mourn now because we see sin rampant. We are those who are meek and should be. And we will inherit the earth. Many of us know what it means to be hungry, not because we've been through financial catastrophe like in the 1920s for those who didn't have food during the times of the war. But we know what it means to be hungry because we didn't get our snack during our break of work between lunch and dinner when we start feeling the munchies. We'll magnify that small hunger into a desire, a passionate instinct for food into an instinct, into a, a surge for the desire of the kingdom's righteousness that Jesus speaks of. Are you hungry for that? Are you, are you so hungry and thirsty after that that you will quench it with a transformed character? How about being merciful? Why, do, why are we told to be merciful? We should automatically be merciful. We have received mercy, and therefore we should be living. Blessed are those who are merciful, he says. Well, they in the end will become subjects and objects of mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, none of us are by nature good in heart. You know, that's another one of those sayings that I hate, especially when it comes from Christians. Oh, just follow your heart. You know what your heart is? Your heart is wicked and evil. It can't be described. It is such an iniquitous world of vile desire. Our heart, if it could express itself, it would say to God, Damn you, God! Damn you! I will put you on a cross! That's what our heart says. It says, I hate you, God. I want to rule. Follow your heart. Might as well follow the devil. Bless the pure in heart, regenerated hearts. Only pure hearts are those that have been touched by God. They will see God. Is our heart, is our motivation, is the inner self, is the inner man pure? This is blessed are those who are peacemakers. This is probably my hardest one because I am by nature and by instinct and by temperament and by practice and by character a war monger. I will kill you in an instant for looking at me the wrong way. I am like Cain. I will kill my brother. And if I can't kill him, I will hate him to death. I am like Lamech who says, if Cain is going to be avenged seven times then I will be avenged 70 times seven. That's who I am. I'm not a peacemaker. I will kill you. And if you're bigger than me, I will get someone to help me. And I will kill you. That is my nature. That is who I am. But God says, bless are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons Christ himself is dying on a cross. And he prays for his captors, his tormentors. He prays for the very people that put him here. And this is why he did. Well, they don't know. If for no other reason 
We are called to be peacemakers because those who can, that come against us, who hate us, they have no idea what they're doing. international diplomacy system. And I'm certainly not speaking about the rights of a nation to defend itself or whatever. But boy, we are too ready to pull the trigger today. We are too ready to hang people. We are too ready to, to put people on death's row. We are too ready. Now, I'm, a, I'm not against the death penalty. Don't get me wrong. But we are a culture of In righteousness sake, 
he was persecuted and what did God do? God orchestrated it so that he could run in another race and he ended up winning that Olympic gold medal and he gave glory to God and he ended up going to China as a missionary and gave his life for the kingdom. the Christian bookstores and what do you see? T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, Joe Austin, filling the books, filling the bookshelves, filling everything that names the name of Christ. This is what people think Christianity is. Is that what they believe we That we live lives like that? Are we sending out the wrong message? Maybe we're not being persecuted because we're just part of the establishment. examine our lives. We need to hear what Jesus is saying to his disciples. We need to remember that these sayings are not just sayings so we can build a theology. These are sayings so that we can build a life. These are sayings that need to be put into practice. These are sayings that need to be done. Otherwise, we are like that man who builds on the same. And though we imagine that we are building palaces, the foundation, folks, is going to sink. With it, all our earthly hopes. So I leave you one simple question. One question. Are you blessed? Lord, again. so earth.